Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Phil Bridges with UNC Health Communications and Marketing. This 30-minute media briefing will feature two medical experts from UNC Health uh, taking questions from you, the media, and then at the end of the briefing, both a video and audio file will be available to all media for their use. Video will be uploaded to YouTube, and we'll send you that link, and then we'll email, if for folks that want it, the uh, audio file, which is about 12 megabytes. And so, and now I will hand it over to my colleague, Alan Wolf, who will introduce today's guest, Alan. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's media briefing will focus on the dangers uh, associated with patients putting off treatment for strokes and heart disease, uh, the shift to virtual care for some patients, and the recent news that coronavirus could cause heart attacks, blood clots, and strokes, especially in younger patients. And then any other questions from the media that, that our experts can handle. Um, our expert uh, is Dr. Diana Sasaki Adams, Associate Professor and Section Chief of Cerebrovascular and Skull Based Neurosurgery at UNC Medical Center in Chapel Hill. And we're still hopeful that uh, Dr. Ravish Sucher, Interventional Cardiologist and Physician in Chief of Heart and Vascular at UNC Rex in Raleigh, will be able to join us. Is Ravish we, can, on? We, can, we can bring him at another time, too, if he doesn't show up today. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get him back on. Dr. Sasaki Adams, thank you for joining us. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your role at, um, at UNC Medical Center and, and what you've been doing differently in the past month? Sure. Um, so uh, as a skull-based surgeon, I, I take care of a lot of tumors, but I also uh, deal with vascular problems. So, uh, hello. Um, aneurysms and strokes. So uh, in this time, aneurysms and strokes are going to continue to happen as well as tumors that are, are pushing on the brain stem and causing problems. And so we need to have a way for patients to have these entities addressed um, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, especially since this uh, looks like it's going to stretch out for some time. We want to be able to take care of the patients that need to get the care um, and not put it off for months. Have you um, found that patients are, are nervous about coming in for treatment or putting things off? I, I think that they are nervous. I think in, initially we were preparing for a big surge like we saw in New York and Italy. And so we, we really cut down on the amount of access that patients could have. Uh, now that we've done a good job of um, sort of shoring up our PPE and resources to allow for accommodating um, more patients with the COVID virus. I think that we are now able to also take care of these other patients that have uh, semi-urgent um, needs and, and need to be addressed. Dr. Sutcher, thank you for joining us as well. Would you like to um, make some opening remarks, just talk a little bit about what, what you do and how things have changed in the past month or two? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Phil. And uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, got stuck coming up here. Um, yeah, so I echo the comments you just heard. Uh, we were all unsure of what to expect. We had seen what had happened in China and then Italy, which was the worst, and then New York. And so we planned for that same surge happening over here as well. A lot of work went into shutting down everything we normally were doing, which actually takes a lot of effort to shut down a fast-moving train and then we prepared for something totally different where we had cardiologists and gastroenterologists and hemonc and other physicians uh, getting into teams to take care of a surge of COVID patients. That meant not only disrupting what they normally did, but also trying to learn what it's like to take care of patients with COVID related problems, which nobody really knew. That appeared to be, as you just heard, some obviously pulmonary uh, issues there, but also potentially thrombotic issues, increased risk of heart attack. We we're getting information from Italy that the majority of patients were dying were actually dying of cardiovascular causes and not necessarily of hypoxia. We weren't sure what to expect. So we planned for absolutely the worst, shut down everything we were doing and except for absolutely emergent cases and planned for this surge. And then the first week went by and then the next week and then the next week and that surge didn't happen over here. Uh, meanwhile, as you just heard, there's patients who needed care, neurovascular care, as you just heard, um, cardiac care, and those patients weren't coming in for two reasons. One, because we had postponed anything but the most emergent or priority cases, 
and also some of them were concerned, uh, and rightfully so, based on what they were seeing happening in other places, about whether or not they should actually come into the healthcare system. So now we've got this uh, group of patients who've been put off and they still need care. And um, as the surge has not happened, we're now going the other way and trying to restart again. And we're actually gonna be restarting to some degree incrementally next week. And it's been an interesting exercise in uh, learning how to pivot in healthcare uh, from going in one direction to the another direction. But I think also very interestingly, it's allowed us to work more closely with our colleagues in other specialties to see how we can come together and actually provide care uh, in a somewhat unprecedented uh, scenario. So, you know, obviously nobody wanted this and it's not good, but there's actually some sort of linings in terms of being able to see how the organization runs, how physicians work together, different groups work together. And it's come together somewhat nicely. Now, how we move from here, how we ramp up, I think that remains to be seen. Um, but uh, it's been tumultuous, uh, to say the least. Great. Um, so now we would like to go ahead and start taking questions from the media. So if you're a member of the media, please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and just jump right in and, uh, and ask your questions. Well, while people are thinking about that, I've got, I got, I got a couple of questions as well. Uh, you know, throughout this pandemic, we've heard that underlying medical conditions often factor in, uh, on, especially on severe cases of COVID-19 and how, how severe they can become. Can you describe the complications brought about for heart and neurological patients that, that have this virus? Sure, Deanna, do you want to take that? Or, yeah, why don't you go ahead and start on, I'll chime in. Sure, so, you know, in the, it's still a new new disease entity and where there's um you know case reports and small series coming out all the time in china about you know five percent of the cases had presented with um uh, some sort of ischemic neurologic problems and so in addition to that there are some case reports of folks having encephalitis or like brain infections seizures um we're all familiar with the the talk of as anosmia um and difficulty with taste, can't smell, can't taste, and we're not sure exactly the underlying pathophysiology of that, um, but smell and taste receptors are in the brain, so we think that there may be some cross-reaction, and perhaps that's an entrance for the virus to, to get into the central nervous system. I think um, recently, you know, New York City, they, they uh, at Mount Sinai, they published a series of five cases of patients who presented with large vessel occlusion in the brain who were under the age of 50. And so they, they describe these young people who were previously healthy, who developed this devastating, potentially devastating problem. And, and one of the, the concerns was if we can get there and we can try to fish out these clots through our um, embolectomy, we, we can potentially save this brain. But there was some delay in their treatment, um, partly because you know, as a 37 year old comes into your office, you're not necessarily thinking they're having a, a large vessel occlusion stroke because the typical age for that is about 74. So identifying that these COVID may play a role in this entity presenting and also getting these patients in knowing we can safely treat them without exposure to, to the virus. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. You know, echoing what you just said about that particular series that just came out, one of the patients uh, who had the symptoms didn't come in herself because she was worried about uh, coming into a healthcare environment and I think delayed her care by 23 hours, which is a long amount of time for the brain to be without oxygen and, and you could potentially reverse that completely if you come in early enough. Um, so underscoring one of the questions you asked about uh, patients being somewhat uh, fearful. But in terms of other comorbidities, we do know that there are certain patient comorbidities that portend an adverse outcome if they were to be affected or infected with COVID. We know that those patients with cardiovascular disease, heart disease, um, vascular disease have a higher mortality. Those patients over 65 have a high mortality in Italy. For example, the majority of patients, I think 86% of those who died were over age of 70. And 96% of those who died were over, or I think something even higher number were over 80. So I'm sorry, 86 were uh, over 80 and 96% were over 70. So it really is a preponderance of uh, high mortality among those who are older. 
Uh, diabetes tends to uh, be a risk factor as well, potentially because of this ARB receptor or ACE receptor uh, through which the virus may actually be uh, getting into cells. That receptor is increased in those patients with diabetes and hypertension, so those patients tend to do worse. Uh, pregnant women, those who have immunosuppression. So those are the patients in whom, if they do get infected, they do worse. Uh, conversely, uh, younger patients, especially the younger you get in this particular disease, uh, you almost get down to a 0% mortality, which is a little bit different than regular influenza, where there is a bimodal distribution of mortality, where very young also get affected and older. But in this case, it really is uh, a disease of the elderly and those with underlying conditions. And I think we had, may have had some folks on mute before. So if you want to go ahead, uh, folks from the media, if you've got questions, just jump right in. Well, I think we answered all the questions. Yeah, I think so. So, well, there was a CNN story that reported that um, the COVID-19 appears to be causing sudden strokes in adults in their 30s and 40s who are not otherwise terribly ill. Uh, has that been the case with other pandemics where you've had a virus causing, uh, causing these types of conditions? Uh, there was a, a series out of the Netherlands looked at their COVID positive patients they estimated that a third of them had some sort of prothrombotic problem, whether it was a DVT, uh, PE, um, or stroke. Um, the strokes that are described in uh, Philadelphia and New York by our neuro colleagues uh, say that they're, they're rapidly forming, um, they're large, and they can be multiple, which is highly unusual um, for our typical ischemic stroke. Usually we see it in just, you know, one particular vessel. Here they're potentially finding it in, in more than, than one vessel and having to more, um, which is very unusual, which would seem to think that there's some sort of prothrombotic uh, tendency in some of these patients. Now, I don't know why these particular more work that needs to be done. It may also be that younger patients can tolerate younger consequences to a better degree, and so that doesn't bring them in until the neurologic comes in. Um, Lynn Bonner, are, are you unmuted now? I am, thank you. I was just wondering whether you've seen that um, those cases of younger people having strokes at UNC. Well, we, we haven't really had the surge in the, in the COVID cases um, as of yet. We've really succeeded in flattening the curve. So it's hard to tell if we've had an uptick in our stroke. Um, you know, we had a couple weeks ago, six strokes uh, in a week, which usually we have one or two. Um, but as far as the age, uh, we haven't been able to really tease out that data and know if we're seeing a spike in younger, younger people. So one of the things that's happened almost paradoxically around the world during this time is that uh, those disease states that we normally see uh, presenting emergently, stroke or heart attacks, STEMIs, have actually gone down uh, a lot. It's unclear why that is, but there are those patients with COVID uh, who in areas who have a lot of COVID infections are coming in with more heart attacks or strokes. But where there's the COVID infection levels are low, there's been a huge reduction in what we normally see. And we don't know why that is. Is that because patients are staying home and therefore are less exposed to stressors of daily life, maybe less, less pollution? Um, is it that, or is it that they're actually having symptoms and not going into the hospital with those symptoms because they're worried? Obviously the latter would be worse, the former would be preferred. But in, in, in one particular week in March in Spain, there was an 80% reduction in the number of patients presenting with a heart attack countrywide when they had the full shutdown. Uh, and that was the similar numbers were reported around the world. And we've seen that same thing here as well, where the normal number of patients we would see, uh, just as you heard with stroke, has become less uh, over this time. Richard Stradling, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to find out what, um, what patients are actually telling you about why they've put off 
care or you know why they didn't uh, seek attention uh, right away and it, how that's different from, like there's there's probably a normal inc inclination to want to wish something away if you have you know the symptoms of a of a heart attack or a, or a stroke and and how so I'm interested in how that has changed during this time of, of coronavirus and what, what you're actually hearing from patients what they're saying to you Um, you know, I think they, I, I will say that with some of the, um, not specifically with stroke, but the, the other thing I take care of a lot of folks are with aneurysms, brain aneurysms, and um, we need to keep treating those folks. Um, but with brain aneurysms and, and traumas that come in, one of the things that we've had to adopt is, is a, a very limited visitor policy. And, um, these events are, are really difficult. Surgery for aneurysms, uh, surgery for brain tumors is very hard. And so a lot of people would like to wait until they can um, have more of a support system around them um, as they go through this treatment. Uh, I think there's also concern about just coming into the hospital, having loved ones exposed. Um, there's just a lot of fear out there. So we're trying very hard to as we start to reopen avenues of care to make sure that people are safe and um, that we can protect them and their loved ones as we care for them. Yeah, so on our side, you know, I guess three broad areas. One is patients coming in for outpatient visits, uh, for routine care or for new problems. And what we've done is we've pivoted very quickly to a virtual way of seeing patients uh, for outpatient care. Um, in the past, uh, telemedicine has been available from a technological standpoint. It's been available FaceTime, et cetera, for the last several years. But from a reimbursement standpoint, because it was not reimbursed the same way regular visits were, the uptake was very low, and it was only maybe for certain uh, specific areas like rural areas, but broadly was not taken up. Early in this, uh, Seema Varma from uh, CMS did a very good thing, which is uh, equalize the payment to the healthcare systems forcing patients, whether it's virtual or not, and that resulted in a rapid ramp, uh, such that we've had a 1,000% increase uh, between March and April in the number of patients we've been seeing uh, virtually, which has been really good because patients don't have to leave the comfort of their own home, and majority of the time, a video visit will accomplish the same things as an in-person visit. And we actually hope that this continues because I think in terms of a lot of patients coming in, driving in, crowding up the healthcare spaces, I think for many reasons, having this available is a, is a good thing long-term. So that's been one good thing. The second is for those patients who were potentially concerned about coming in for a procedure that was needed, uh, either urgent or priority. Um, if the, what we found was that if the regular uh, avenue of calling them from the schedulers or from staff wasn't working, if a physician called and explained why it was needed, that they were much more likely to come in uh, after that discussion. So we've, we've increased that as well uh, so that there's direct physician interaction with the patients, um, and then that makes things easier. And the last area is, as, as you just heard, if, when they come into the hospital, sometimes um, their loved ones can't come in because we're, we have a strict no visitor policy to, to protect everyone. And that sometimes is a, is a hindrance as well because they don't want to come in for, for example, a bypass procedure where they'll be in the hospital for five days and then not have uh, access to family members. And so those are reasons why they may push it off. Um, and so we try to work around that. I had a quick question real quick, if I can jump in. Go ahead, Tyler. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'm curious about the symptoms. You know, I know there's different signs for stroke and heart attack, but I'm wondering how COVID-19 plays into that because I know some symptoms associated with COVID-19 may be similar to stroke and heart attack. So. Um, how has that affected, I guess, the evaluation and how patients are, um, I, I guess, we, you know, looked at in terms of, you know, priority and treatment and, how, you know, how, how to address their situation? Um, for the stroke symptoms, some of the papers suggest that the, the strokes potentially can even precede any of the other typical symptoms of COVID that we've heard about, um, including the fever and cough. Um, in, in other folks, it seems to come later on after they've been kind of dealing with something for a while. 
Uh, so it's a little bit unpredictable. And then there's also this potentially asymptomatic population that makes it very difficult to tell who um, may need to be tested. Uh, we have expanded our testing for the people who don't have taste or smell because that seems to be seen more often as a, a sign that they could have under COVID disease. Um, however, if that's an unusual presentation for an acute stroke to just lose your sense of taste or smell. If you have sudden, you know, weakness on one side of the body, numbness on one side of the body, can't speak, um, you should seek emergency attention or have your loved one seek emergency attention um, because we could, it may not be COVID related at all. Um, if it is or it isn't, it's, it's something that I think we can address. And then I have one other follow-up question in terms of how quickly or how critical it is that people get seen, you know, um, in terms of a time frame, you because know, I know some people are delaying treatment or they may wait a day and they've had chest pain or they've had numbness or, and they may, you know, kind of blow it off and then decide you know, to come in two days later. I mean, how critical is it for people to get in, um, you know, as soon as possible? I mean, you know, what kind of, how does that factor in in terms of overall survival rates and things like that? So I think for the two disease states that are represented by the physicians here, I think it's critical. Uh, there are avenues to be seen. Uh, you, almost all the physicians in this area, in primary care or otherwise, have pivoted very quickly to some type of virtual ability to see the patients. That's one. You can call your primary care provider or if you have a neurologist or uh, access to a neurologist or a cardiologist or gastroenterologist, whatever it may be, important to call that office and get that taken care of. Obviously, if you have got symptoms of chest pain or stroke, like you just heard, um, time is critical. And so calling 911 is always available. And then urgent cares and emergency rooms are available as well. So there's actually no reason to delay care. There's plenty of avenues still available. And there's every, every reason to not delay care. If you delay care, there's a lot of risk and there's no benefit. So uh, I think uh, more than ever, that should be done. In, in, and the reason I say more than ever is um, if the data from Italy showed us that a lot of patients are presented with simple things like you know, just shortness of breath, but no chest pain or no stroke symptoms. Actually, we're having a lot more going underlying. The troponins were positive, the enzymes were positive. There was a lot more going on by the time they developed even minimal symptoms. So it is important always to seek attention when these types of symptoms develop, but even more so right now. And I think the message should be that there is uh, care available in a safe way, whether it's virtual or otherwise, so that the risk of the patient is minimized. Uh, Jared Thompson, I know you had a question. I'm sorry we didn't get you earlier. Can you go ahead and jump in? Yeah, I know a lot of people are talking about that uh, treatment that came out of the UNC's Chapel Hills uh, campus about uh, diminishing the recovery time for COVID-19. Are you all familiar with that and how important this is? I'm not, I'm not participating in that study, and so I, I, I can't really comment on that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, me either. Um, any additional uh, media questions? Yeah. For folks that aren't so familiar with it, um, could you explain to, to our participants today and those watching later, why, why are blood clots so dangerous and what is the treatment for these patients? So bl blood clots, uh, whether it's arterial or venous, as you heard er earlier, there seems to be some type of a prothrombotic state. Prothrombotic meaning these patients are mm -hmm. developing clots when they normally shouldn't be developing clots. And patients tend to have underlying disease states that result in clots on the arterial side or clots that develop on the venous side. What we're seeing in this particular case is patients presenting with clots on both the arterial and venous side with multiple organs involved. For example, the brain, as you just heard, patients presenting with heart attacks where there's clots in arteries where there's no other disease, there's no plaque buildup, but just a clot shows up somewhere. So that's, that's somewhat new. Patients presenting with kidney failure, and when autopsies are done, they find um, thrombi uh, all over the kidneys. Same, similarly, in the lungs, they're finding the same thing. Or they're finding DVTs, which is blood clots in the legs, which can then break off and go to the lungs. So something is going on, uh, and we don't know what's causing that. Something about the virus is causing that. But the reason those clots are a problem is because once they develop, they stop blood flow from going to the end organ. 
And so if the clot develops somewhere in the brain arteries, it stops blood from going to the brain, something in the heart going to the heart muscle. And if blood doesn't get to the heart muscle or to the brain or somewhere else, it doesn't get oxygen. And if it doesn't get oxygen, it dies. And so this is happening all over the body in multiple areas. And that's why you may be seeing in these, some of these patients have become very sick, multi-organ failure, where it's uh, across the board um, that the, the liver may fail, the kidneys may fail, they may end up on dialysis, they have cardiac issues, pulmonary issues, brain issues, all happening simultaneously. Um, any additional questions from the media? We do have a few minutes left. One question that uh, we had heard was, you know, when COVID-19 sort of first appeared on the scene, it seemed like it was overwhelmingly respiratory concern. Um, you know, we've got the respiratory diagnostic centers. When did physicians begin to notice the effects on, on the heart and the brain and other organs that it, that it wasn't just a respiratory disease? I, I think that there was more attention to it um, as Italy uh, was more of a focus. I, I feel that um, uh, perhaps the neurointerventional presence is, is pretty high in Italy, and I think that they started noticing that there was potentially a correlation. Um, in retrospect, when they go back into Wuhan, they have looked at neurologic complications in, in one of their series, and there's a lot of very early um, sort of case reports and, and things coming out to try to really assess what is going on and where this is leading and how we can, we've always been behind the ball at this, this virus. It would be great if we can just get ahead a little bit to sort of anticipate who was coming, what they were coming in with and how we could best treat them. And so the more we can look at who's coming in and in other places, you know, places that have had terrible surges and, and really delve into that data, um, I think that that will help us as we brace for more cases. Um, I know that uh, some hospitals have started to put all COVID-19 patients on low doses of blood thinners to, to try to prevent clots. Has that been UNC's practice and are there dangers associated with that? Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm not working on the primarily COVID unit, um, so I don't know if they've adopted that, but on a surgical floor, we um, are aggressive with starting our um, anti, um, our, our, what we call our DVT prophylaxis, because when people undergo surgery or in a stressful situation and are immobilized, as they often are in the hospital, um, it's important to try to start them on that to keep blood going. Now we haven't, I don't believe, adjusted any of the doses for those other patients, but it is um, definitely in our thoughts as we're treating these people. Yeah, similarly on this side, I don't think we've uh, gone to a practice of routinely treating them with uh, antithrombotics such as heparin, but the threshold at which we start that has come lower. Now, we, as you heard earlier, we haven't had the surge that we expected, so the sample size of patients we've treated isn't huge as uh, New York or Italy, but in those patients who have come in, they tend to be very sick once they get to the ICU. They stay in the ICU once they get intubated or a tube put down. They tend to have that tube in for about two weeks. So once they get sick, they get very sick, but those who don't get sick tend to go home. And among those who get here, we have lowered the threshold of starting antithrombotic treatment. Great. Um, any final thoughts? We're just about out of time. You know, I, I, the only thing I would add is that this really has been, as I mentioned early, a, a very interesting time in terms of everybody coming together, the hospital administration, the physician, various groups coming together. One of the things that um, we, you have, everybody's heard about is personal protective equipment or PPE and the lack of it because everybody needs it and the world just wasn't ready for this type of a demand. And so we, the administration here in the hospital has done a very good job in procuring it. Um, to the extent that we can get more, there are certain type of masks, uh, the N95 masks, I'm sure everybody's heard about. If there is availability, if there are uh, sources available, if there are people who wanna donate, we still need those because those specific N95 masks are hard to come by. So that would be still very helpful because even though things have not surged as we would expect, one way to prevent all that from happening is to keep patients and providers protected. So uh, that's the only thing I would say as a plug, if that is out there, 
and people have availability, it would be much appreciated. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we are over time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as I said, we will post this on uh, YouTube, so you can use that recording for television. Um, and then we'll have a separate audio file for folks that just want to review what was discussed, or if uh, radio stations are interested and would like to have the, uh, the audio there. So thank you very much, and we will see you on our next one at Monday.